Welcome back to another special edition of Coffee and Conversation, the stay-at-home edition. I'm your host, Karim Rafa, and I'm joined with Dr. CJ Meadows, the director of I2E, the Innovation Entrepreneurship Center of SP Jain School of Global Management. CJ, welcome back. Thank you for having me back. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Now, to dive right in with a maximum or a large amount of people currently teleworking or telecommuting, per se, what are the immediate pros and cons that jump to mind? Oh, gosh. Well, let's start with some pros. Um, everybody knows about uh, the fact that all of a sudden people are not having to spend time commuting and they can have some time to sleep, exercise, spend with loved ones and all of that. Um, there's actually new research that shows that teleworkers are both more productive and more satisfied and that'll, that'll help to impact the disengagement of employees across the globe. About 85% of them apparently are and that will could provide its own 450 to 550 billion dollar stimulus package just by allowing people to be more engaged with what they do, have more control, work from home. However, there are some downsides. So from the business perspective, uh, there are examples like in Japan, for example, where contracts need to have not just a signature, but a company stamp, a CHOP. Nobody has the CHOP at home, and nobody can get into the office, or there's a great deal of trouble to do that. So there are some new problems trying to keep business running in old ways, and we're having to deal with that right now. Um, from a personal perspective, some people are having trouble managing their work at home as if they were at work. Let me give you an example. Um, when I was doing my doctorate at Harvard Business School, one of our doctoral students was a co-founder of Staples, office supply superstore. So having been an entrepreneur and a mother of three, she knew how to manage home life and work life. And she said, doctorate? No problem, just treat it like a job. So if you're treating your work from home as if you were in the office, but a lot more convenient, most people who are doing that are finding they're, they're happy and fine. Um, we track our hours uh, and, and we take the same breaks, we go to work on time, etc., cetera, um, and in very comfortable clothes. But some people are having trouble, especially those with small children, um, separating work life and home life and making sure that they actually cover both. And so some people are winding up working all night and then taking care of family all day, which as you can tell, obviously would not work. It's just too much. It is an unprecedented time in a sense. I mean, you mentioned children. At the moment, children aren't going to school. They're being homeschooled per se, or homework is given to them and the parents have to do it with them. So you're really splitting your time between personal time children's education time and work time, and none of these have clear boundaries, so it's a very challenging time. It is a hugely challenging t thing, and as a matter of fact, as a home homeschool mom for four teenagers, I've had that challenge all along, but I've had more work hours because I had to do more meetings and travel, and I've had more commuting time. I'm finding it fantastic to collect together the time I had spent traveling, commuting, and whatnot, and I'm actually devoting that to my homeschoolers. And what I'm finding is that it's a huge boost to their productivity because what they really didn't need from me was someone to be a teacher or a tutor. They needed somebody to be a manager. How do you think you can have a virtual workspace with healthy employee en engagement and be a good manager? Or what's happening in companies where you actually see the opposite in bad management? We're seeing companies manage the situation badly where they're requiring more paperwork and reporting of their employees because they don't trust them and they want to see what are you doing every minute of every day or managers are using up their time calling workers interrupting what they do when really they should just manage the outcomes and let them manage the process however they're most productive as a matter of fact if you if you look at motivation literature and the practice of motivation by really top leaders, what you'll see is that people, the number one thing that motivates people is impact. Not bonuses, mm -hmm. not money, not prestige. 
They want to see the impact of what they do. If you show them that and get behind them in a helpful way to manage the process and have the impact, and here I'll show you the wonderful impact you have, your employees are going to be a lot more motivated. Thank you so much for that insight, CJ. We're joined now with Jawahar Kanjidan, the founder of Team Streams and a pioneer in mobile and consumer internet services. Jawahar, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Now, we assume that digital transformation is for everyone, but how does that work in countries where people can't necessarily telecommute, say India or Vietnam or the Philippines, for example? Oh, very good point. You know, digital services and digital transformation in the current COVID times is all focused on working from home. And it's so much, uh, you know, skewed towards the really upper echelons of the digital, uh, digitally enabled. But when you look at digital transformation that is touching the lives of farmers, teachers, uh, delivery boys, uh, generally the informal sector, you know, the, 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 uh, the level even below the SMEs is phenomenal. And uh, uh, they've never worked from home. Now, how do we empower all of them on uh, their digital journey is a very, very big uh, opportunity here. Regarding all the cultural implications, CJ, I'm sure you have quite a few insights for us. Absolutely. You know, and I, I've got even more questions than insights. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is enabling people to work from home and digitally transforming the home work activity. But what about digital transformation in the field? What about, uh, do you have some insights, Jawahar, on <clears throat> getting information out to farmers in the field logistics workers as they're del delivering things, getting in digital connectivity to people in a shop or moving between shops so that people can find out, do you have the thing I want? Can I meet you and, and buy this product? Yeah, so, uh, so looking at the digital transformation for each of these personas on the field is, a, uh, is uh, I would say, you know, you've got to hit the gem of the inside. And what we've seen is there are three vectors primarily. So one is uh, that define the context. One obviously is the persona, the profile. Uh, so if I am a farmer, what do I grow? If I am a student, uh, what's my level of, uh, you know, what class, grade, subject am I in? The second thing is uh, the location. Uh, so depending on the location, the advice would change. So the context changes. So if I am in front of a shop, if I am a distributor sales rep, just about to make a sale to the retailer, uh, my context is what kind of information I need about that particular outlet personalized to that particular instant. So is there a way in which you can uh, reinforce elements that uh, the system has prompted you along the day to do and are able to show at the end of the day kind of a you know reflective report card that great you had seven uh, visits to do seven sales calls to do you did uh, six now you see that you had learned about this topic and so therefore you were able to successfully sell to so many more people than what you would uh, you would have done a month back as a matter of fact, that's an, a very exciting process that, that you've outlined for developing these, these digital transformations with impact. And um, it's an absolutely crucial process in an emerging economy. What you always have to start with is what's the real problem. And if you're coming from a different business environment, you can't assume that your business problems are the same as the problems on the ground in a different location. So you've got to define your, your problems well. You've got to really understand who you're designing for and what it is that they need in this context, which is going to be different. So Jawahar, in countries or cities with traditionally high levels of brain drain, how do you fill the gap that's left by middle managers in, in, most, in most common scenarios in, in, in high DT? Good managers are very rare to come by and obviously mm -hmm. um, uh, when you go uh, up country uh, the quality of manpower probably is not as great as uh, where you would found, find in uh, urban areas or cities. So there are ways in which you can codify this behavior and ensure that each individual and they could be in tens of thousands, let's say 20,000 uh, field force uh, of mine 
uh, I have a sales force of 20,000 guys on the ground and each of them has an app which talks individually and personalized to them. For example, wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, you would know the skill level uh, for negotiation skills versus account management mm -hmm. versus visual merchandising versus time management versus about your product A, B, C, D. As they gain those skills, as they put them in practice, you are able to show how they are going up. Now there will be some lazy guys, right? And knowledge deteriorates, knowledge decays. So the system also needs to take into effect or take into account that if you are not in, 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 uh, in practice, then you risk losing a little power, just like video games mm -hmm. do, or just like your airline miles get lapsed, etc. right? I feel like managers are, are found in two batches. Some are supercharged because of the DT abilities of the company. And like you say, quantifying qualitative skills, which is usually just done in person. Whereas others are left thinking what their role actually entails if it's not wandering around a sales floor making sure everyone does their jobs. If, if I could jump in here, um, I've been talking to a number of managers and, and you're right, they come into two camps. Some of them just call their teammates and their employees saying, what are you doing, what are you doing, what are you doing? Um, and some of them are realizing that this is an opportunity for something more. And what they're doing is they're systematizing what they do and how they manage people. And for guidance, they're making videos and putting them online um, and extending their reach to their employees via virtual means. And the next step, of course, would be artificial intelligence. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you, uh, CJ. Uh, it is that, uh, you know, how do you, how do you transcend from good uh, behaviors in the real world, uh, systemize them, uh, and then try and see if you can amplify those uh, and then ensure that that gets disseminated. Jawahar, thank you so much for all that insight and for taking the time for dialing in with us today. It was a pleasure to have you on. It was my pleasure. Thank you. So that was some great insight from Jawahar, and especially when it comes to the tech scaling a manager's ability to manage at scale, really. What do you think CJ is going to be the future of work, and where does tech have its place in that? You know, I think the future of work is that we're going to be co-working, not just with each other, but with our technology. And we're going to be co-thinking with our data analytics and artificial intelligence. So it's going to be artificial intelligence plus human intelligence. So I think the future of work is going to be treating our technology more like a co-worker and learning how to co-work and co-think effectively with them. And where there aren't available humans for particular spots in an organization, let the technology fill it if that's appropriate and develop people, if that's appropriate, with good technology tools. It really does turn tech into a scalability tool. But if we talk about, say, physical infrastructure, I know it costs around $11,000 a year to house an employee in an office setting. Where do you see that going now that everyone's telecommuting and that tech has replaced, to some extent, the physical requirements? I do believe companies have a great deal of money to save on their end by letting people come in and hop desk and co-work within a, a, the same company. From the employee's perspective, someone asked me the other day, okay, so should companies pay employees instead of paying that 11000 for the office space, so now an employee has to get another room in their home. They've got to rent a bigger place or buy a bigger place. Well, not, not necessarily. Employees are willing to forego that if they don't have to pay for the transportation, the time they take to do it, the fancy clothing, the lunches out, the uh, dry cleaning and so forth. So there's a lot of good economics on both sides for flexible working opportunities. Fantastic. What an exciting time to be alive. Yes. Thank you, CJ, so much for coming on again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you all for watching and do stay tuned for more COVID-related episodes.